Welcome to Series 1, Episode 0 of Learning is the New Working, a brand new podcast series brought to you by the Learning Futures Group, where our goal is to help learning leaders build organizations and focused work cultures that help transform, innovate, and build trust with employees and customers. My name is Chris Peary. I'm the CEO of the Learning Futures Group and your host for what we hope will be a brilliant set of conversations with leading edge practitioners in fields related to the future of workplace learning. We'll explore topics that we believe are critical to build a modern approach to learning and development in the face of profound changes in the workplace. We'll cover topics including neuroscience, data science, software engineering, social science and design thinking and a host of others. We believe this is really important work and we approach it with passion, curiosity and a learning mindset. On the way, I'll be sitting down with academics, writers, thinkers and edtech vendors and practitioners, including chief learning officers, who are all redefining the future of workplace learning. We'll learn a lot together and I hope we'll have some fun. Because while the future may be uncertain, it's our job to make work and the workplace much, much cooler. In this first series, you'll hear conversations with people like Lisa K. Solomon, noted futurist author and designer in residence at the Stanford D School. Danny Johnson, co-founder and lead analyst at Red Thread Research, and learning and technology entrepreneurs Sam Herring and Ludo Farage. In this teaser episode, I'll reverse roles and I'm going to sit in the interviewee chair where I talk with Learning Futures Group Chief Scribe and technology journalist Gary Flood about our mission, our aspirations for the podcast series, and how we can help learning leaders prepare for a cooler future. This episode, and indeed the entire series, is brought to you by our friends at Intrepid Learning. Intrepid offer a collaborative learning platform that empowers organizations to solve high-stakes business challenges through engaging and applied learning at scale. Intrepid's approach helps individual learners improve and organizations transform and grow. Please check them out at intrepidlearning.com. I thought the future would be cooler. Five, four, three, two, one. So this is the first episode of season one in a new podcast you're calling Learning is the New Working. Chris, that's a provocative title. Why have you called it that? What are you asking us to think about? Well, Gary, as you know, the workplace is facing massive disruption and transformation. Um, Thanks in large part to a whole raft of new technologies that are sort of growing incrementally influential in in the workplace, um, such as the rise of the robots, or some people call the fourth industrial revolution. But I think there's a consensus that it seems likely that the ability to learn for individuals and the ability to create learning environments for organizations will be an essential survival skill and hopefully a competitive differentiator Mm -hmm. and create value. Um, But there is a couple of problems. First of all, Skills and talent have never been more top of mind for leaders, both in companies and governments. Uh, For example, last year, the conference board came out with a report that said talent was the number one concern in the C-suite for CEOs and uh, CHROs. And uh, even in governments, you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff from the World Economic Forum about the concern around an uncertain future for the availability of skills and people being displaced by technology. And yet, we spend $50 billion on workplace learning, ATD uh, study, um, but we've got very few useful measures of the impact and efficiency of that spend. And frankly, a lot of evidence, there's not a lot of confidence that our learning and development teams can step up and help. Mm. For individual learners, it's pretty drastic too. So uh, a recent Burson study said that just 1% of the work work week is available to people to learn. And according to a study by our friends at Degreed, sort of learners are taking matters into their own hands 
and uh, they're studying their own courses four times more than they're studying the courses kind of recommended to them for their uh, for, uh, by their L&D department. So, so you know, they're, they're kind of voting with their feet. And then for the most part, L&D departments themselves uh, don't have a lot of confidence in their ability, uh, mainly because they're working with a set of tools that were developed a hundred years ago in, in sort of factory-like conditions. So what we believe we need are learning scientists. Okay. And so, so this concept of learning scientists says we borrow, we borrow knowledge and capability uh, from adjacent fields, and we help learning and development teams get much more scientific in what they do. So, for example, we see lots of leading-edge organizations experimenting with developing learning-oriented cultures, creating tangible market value uh, by doing amazing things. There's some wonderful creativity out there. Uh, we're seeing input from four or five adjacent disciplines, including neuroscience, where we're hmm. rapidly improving our understanding of how uh, to create the optimum conditions for the brain to learn. Uh, we've got the use of these amazing tools that will allow us to kind of pinpoint where learning's needed by dipping into the uh, the expertise of learning scientists. We have design thinkers who can help us build amazing programs that are creative and engaging. And so in this podcast series, we want to meet and learn from people uh, who are working in these domains and uh, what we believe sort of charting the future of workplace learning. That's, uh, that's quite a program of work. Let's, uh, let's put that in a bit of context about uh, you and your organization. Let's back up a little bit. Who is Chris and why don't we hear a little bit more about the journey that's led you to see these insights about uh, the current state of workplace learning? Well, Gary, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm a 30-year veteran uh, of the software industry, 108 straight financial quarters at Microsoft and Oracle, and uh, a lot of collaboration with Deloitte and many, many other uh, chief learning officers uh, around the world uh, in large organizations. Uh, my career has been about technology um, and specifically technology in the context of adult and sort of workplace learning, um, including sales enablement at Microsoft and a lot of for-profit training businesses um, in other companies. So um, I, I built a great network with lots of CLO friends, uh, some technology people and academics, um, and I've worked at the coalface, had a lot of failures and a few successes. And um, at this point, I think it's time for me to really help move the discipline forward through my work with the Learning Futures Group. And so in the fall of 2018, uh, I left Microsoft and set up this organization. We're a loosely coupled group of experts and um, pretty experienced people, including researchers and ex-CLOs, uh, really with the mission of helping this discipline sort of get to the next level and um, kind of step up and create value where there is a de desperate need uh, for value because people want to know how to be better learners and want to prepare themselves uh, for the future workplace. Okay, you've convinced me. I think you've paid your dues and you uh, <laughs> probably know what you're talking about, Chris. So uh, let's hear more about this season one of the podcast. Have you got, uh, can you share any names and or topics of that you've got lined up? Well, we're, we're learning. The whole point about Learning Futures Group, Gary, is we don't have all the answers. Uh, I think we have a few questions uh, and so we're actively going out there to learn and uh, as well as you know the consulting services that we do and the other customer engagements the podcast series is a fantastic opportunity to reach out and hear from people who are doing great work either edge practitioners or people in those adjacent fields like neuroscience and data science and computer science that we think can teach us some stuff and so that's really what we want the podcast to do um, the first season uh, includes some really great examples of that. People who uh, taught me about design thinking, for example, like Lisa K. Solomon. She's a, uh, a writer, an author, and uh, she is the designer in residence at the D School at Stanford. And she talks uh, to us in the series about uh, her passion for learning and why she thinks design is a key 
skill and expertise that we need to kind of land in uh, workplace learning teams. Uh, research and data is critically important. We talked to Danny Johnson, who is uh, a really renowned workplace learning and talent researcher. Uh, she's from. She was with uh, Burson by Deloitte, and now she set up her own company called Red Thread Research. Really fascinating conversation with her about how to make tomorrow better and how to really engage with researchers in a useful way. We talked to a couple of practitioners from edtech startups, and uh, we really get sort of like start to uh, uncover the kind of conversations that we think we can have sort of uh, moving forward. That genuinely sounds great. Um, I don't want to be kind of greedy here, but uh, looking even further ahead, what kind of guests do you see coming onto the podcast? Are there, you going to be exploring the topics you've identified? You're going to deepen that engagement, talk about other things? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I love the podcast format and the form factor and, and it's, it's really having its moment right now because it's intimate conversations with people uh, and you can learn from people in a really quick uh, uh, sort of quick uh, fun and informal way um, but we're going to really be looking for people who can help us define what the future of learning science looks like um, so data scientists people with communication skills um, there was so much work going on in the neuroscience space uh, um, uh, that, that's sort of helping us understand a tiny little bit more about how the brain works and more importantly, what are the conditions that you need to create for good learning to happen, um, whether it's deep study or in the flow of work type learning. Uh, we're going to talk to um, some thought leaders and writers and sociologists uh, and of course, we're going to talk to chief learning officers who are trying experiments and doing interesting things. Um, I have a conversation later today with a chief learning officer who is really doing some kind of amazing stuff and has learned a lot. So um, that's that's how we'll proceed. Um, and of course, if listeners have ideas of people they want to hear from, uh, we're absolutely happy to take those ideas too. Okay, you've convinced me. I want to sign up. How often will this podcast appear? Where can I hear it, and how do I go forward? Well, we're going to publish every two weeks, Gary. That's once a fortnight for you. Um, and uh, we hope to be available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud. And uh, if you have another preferred podcast platform, then let us know, and we'll push out to that platform too. Um, you can also get the full archive at Learning Futures Group website, which is www.learningfuturesgroup.com, and it would be good, and uh, it would be good of me at this point to give a shout out to Intrepid by Vital Source, who are our sponsors for season one, which is now in the can, and we're very grateful for them for that uh, sponsorship and support. Is this all for corporate America alone, Chris? I mean. I don't know if you consider other sectors might appreciate some of these insights. Well, um, absolutely not. I mean, I think, the first of all, uh, the corporate sector is changing. So the relationships between workers and their employers, you know, is one of these massive disruptions uh, that, that, that's, that's coming at us. And so that we think about that a lot. But I think there are also a lot of things we can learn from sort of non-commercial organizations. You know, Gary, I do a lot of work in the not-for-profit se sector with, with, with NGOs and international NGOs. Um, last fall, I took a whole group of chief learning officers to Geneva to spend a week with the International Federation of the Red Cross. And a really amazing thing happened. I, uh, I think most people expected on both sides of the equation that these uh, you know, denizens and experts from industry were going to help the Red Cross get much, much better at doing this. Um, in point of fact, at the end of the week, I think those of us from the commercial environment learned much, much more from, from the Red Cross. After all, you know, they have 11 million volunteers that they train every year through grassroots uh, efforts and through at scale using what's available kind of approaches. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity. And I really think that, look at the core Learning Futures Group says, you know, what we're doing today isn't working. And so let's look around for help. Let's look around for examples, whether it's academics, uh, neuroscientists, 
or other practitioners, practitioners in different domains who are doing really high quality 